once professional marketers were itty bitty baby marketers, going to school, trying to figure out and learn the basics. And they learned things like the four Ps and phrases like right message, right time, right person, right place, the basics. Now, because of that, when two marketers talk, they know what they're talking about. There's a shared knowledge, a shared understanding of what these terms mean. In employer branding, we don't have that same foundation. None of us went to school, none of us went to college and have a degree in employer branding. When I'm talking about an EVP, what do I mean? It's very likely that your understanding and conceptualization of an EVP is different than mine. Same thing for employer brand, same thing for brand direction. There's any number of terms that we use and throw around every single day in which it's very possible that we are talking past each other. So in this, the fifth episode of The Brand Plan, Marcus and I lay down the law and define the basic terms that we use every single day. Hey, Marcus. Hey, James, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. How are things in London? Uh, things in London are lovely. I'm playing trumpet in a jazz gig tonight, which always puts me in a good mood. So, you know, hopefully that, that will carry me through this, this next episode. This is our fifth episode. I guess we're making this a going concern. Absolutely. And, you know, I just want to say a big shout out to everyone who's given us kind of positive feedback and, and, you know, we really appreciate it. This is obviously a bit of a bit of a new joint venture and there have been some really kind words, uh, both in public and in private messages. Thanks so much to everyone for, for reaching out. Yeah. And if you're interested in reaching out more, we've also got a website, the brand plan dot show. And the neat little trick the website does is you have a little form you can fill out and ask us questions or kind of say something or tell us our video is funny looking, or you can actually leave us a voicemail. There's a button in the bottom right hand corner of that website. Click the little microphone, leave us a voicemail. Spoiler, we may end up using it on the show. Who's to say? We don't know yet. This being episode five, it's finally time to talk about some the serious stuff, unlike all the other stuff I guess we've been talking about. Um, I've always joked that because employer brand is so new, it's very easy to, for someone to come in and say, I'm going to tell you what the definitions are, but those definitions are very, very biased because they're going to set me up to sell you this thing that turns out that only I sell. Let's try and wipe the slate a little clean in here, take the, uh, the big eraser to the big whiteboard and set up some definitions that anybody can use when they're talking internally, when they're talking to an agency, when they're talking to a practitioner, when they're talking to somebody in another company, right? One of the things I feel like is when I talk to some TA leaders about EVP, they know that their friend over in blah, 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 blah company got an EVP and it didn't work for them and therefore all EVPs are bad, yeah, which yeah. is, not fair, but here we are. So let's come up with some nice agnostic and more importantly, useful definitions around employer brand. How's that sound? That sounds brilliant. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a really helpful thing. We, we have to do this internally at the agency all the time. And, you know, even the people who work in this all the time will constantly be talking to each other going, what do we think this means exactly and pedantically? Because, it, you know, actually, if we're going to work together on projects and you're going to have a team of five of us working on something, we have to all agree exactly what we yeah. meant by something as well. And it's really, really important to just know what you think it means and be absolutely crystal clear with, you know, whether it's your stakeholders or a supplier or your colleagues about this is what I am doing now. This is what I mean by this phrase. And, you know, who cares if someone else has got a different definition of it? Well, you know, I'll know it, but I, I'm fine with my def That's absolutely fine. But I think yeah. you do need to know what you mean by it. Don't assume that the person saying to you, oh, yeah, your EVP does this. They may have a completely different definition there that they're working to, and that can cause you all sorts of problems later on down the line. So, yeah, I mean, where do you want to start? Well, we're what? talking about very abstract concepts here. I, I mean, I find myself, I have to write about them and kind of say, okay, where am I drawing that line between these two ideas? To me, they're all glummed up, but it doesn't matter because it's just me in my head. Uh, but even individually, it's good to know what's going on. So I think a good starting point is, We've talked about talent strategy. We've talked about employer brand, employer brand strategy. I think we should we could start either by defining an EVP or we could start by talking about the kind of contrast between an EVP and an employer brand. A lot of them, a lot of people conflate them or, or just you know decide they're the same thing. Well, let's let's put some light daylight between the two. Sure. Okay. Uh, shall I go first and then you yeah. respond? So I mean, sometimes the way I put it to people is that you know. If you're going to take the language, so the, the, the whole phrase value proposition comes from consumer marketing. It's something we stole from the consumer marketing world. Um, 
as indeed some of you based in London may have met Simon Barrow who did it. Um, he, you know, I bumped into at conferences various times. But the idea was, we'll take this language from consumer marketing and turn it into something that we're going to use in employment marketing. And if you take that original version, you'll, the EVP is the logical sell. That's all it is. To, to the person who might work for you is, this is the sell for why you should come and work here. In the same way that the value proposition for a chocolate bar was, these are the reasons you want to buy this chocolate bar. And, and reasons, plural, right? That was always built into consumer value proposition. It's more yeah. than one thing. Yeah. And, and it, but it's quite a logical thing. Whereas once you start moving into branding, you're now moving away from the logic of stuff into the emotion of stuff. And that's different. I'm just gonna explain why I think that's different and why I think that's important. Um, I have the, the Marcus theory of buying and making decisions, which is that the, the amount of logic you put into a decision is inversely proportional to how important it is. So to put that in context, I recently bought a headset to use at work, which is something not very important, and I spent hours researching every possible headset I could buy, and then bought the best one, and I've read the reviews and all the rest of it. Whereas the flat I am sitting in, which is worth considerably more than that headset, I bought by walking in the door and went, oh, it feels lovely. I then back rationalized that with lots of logic of, oh, it's got good transport links and it's in a nice bit of London and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But actually almost like the big decisions you make incredibly emotionally. Yes. And I'm afraid moving employer is a big decision and you are going to make it emotively. It's going to be based on a feeling, a feeling that going over there will be better for me, a feeling that going over there will be more enjoyable, a feeling that going over there will challenge me more. And it's not something you actually know until you get mm -hmm. there. And then you find out if you were right or not. But it is very, very emotive. So I think value propositions tend to be very, quite logic heavy. When you move into brand is when you're going to start injecting the emotion into that thing. But you've got to have the logic in place first to know what emotion you're going to go and try and drive. So there we yeah. go. That's, that's my blurb on EVP versus employer brand. How about, how about you? Well, first, I'm going to tell you, I, don't, I, I, I like the Marcus theory. I think it's a nice add-on to all the math and the brain science that says we do actually make big decisions emotionally and we post-rationalize yeah. why that is. And there's lots of studies and, 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 you know, to get into that. But I, I think it's an interesting kind of corollary to say, look, it, the level of, of, of importance to you is how you measure that. And I think you're 100% right. You do make these decisions emotionally. And I think yeah. what happens is, is because these decisions happen over a great deal of time, we're slowly collecting information and impressions and touch points about said company, sometimes subconsciously, right? We saw the commercial or we know a buddy who did a thing who connected, said something nice or said something bad about the company. And that moment, you know, to Google's point, the zero moment of decision or the zero moment of, you know, whatever, is when you're on that job board and that logo pops up and you go, oh, do I, I feel something positive or I feel something negative about that. And that is like, that is so much of where the decision gets made, that, that initial funnel entry decision. It is emotional, and I think that it is complicated because companies are vast organisms, most of whom do not talk to each other on a regular basis, if at all. And so consequently, yeah. what customer service does impacts employer brand, what leadership does impacts employer brand, what recruiting does impacts employer brand, everything impacts employer brand. But it's not like they all got into a big room and said, hey, everybody, how are we going to talk yeah. about our employer brand? And how does it affect customer service and product selection and feature selection and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so consequently, People are forced to make these very complicated amalgam pictures of the company, right? I'm never going to apply for a cable company because I've once had to talk to a cable company about service. And once you have that phone call, you're never applying for those jobs ever again. I'm sorry. It's just, it's not an exciting moment, but the employer brander didn't sit and show up in the customer service team and say, you should really be as boring and as, as, less, as unhelpful as possible. That's, that's useful. No, completely. And, and this is most job decisions. Like, actually, my last job move was weird in that it wasn't that way because I was coming back to a company I'd worked at before and a lot of the management team was still in the same place. But that's really unusual that I actually knew what I was joining. Every other job move I've ever made, I haven't known. I've had strong suspicions or weak yep. suspicions or like I've had greater or le lesser levels of confidence in what I'm doing. But it, it's kind of, so I think that's where I would tend to draw that dividing line is, if you're in the field of coming up with a logical case why someone should join you, you're in EVP territory. As soon as you start going, right, now let's turn that into something, the emotive version of that, that is going to actually move people to do something. Now you're in the territory of branding and you're gonna be in the territory of coming up with 
a creative look and feel and you know strap lines and videos and and emotive things designed to make me feel a way okay now yeah. we're in the realm of employee branding and these things are completely related to each other and, and i would, would hasten to add this also applies if you're using it internally as well same thing True. if it's the logic of why someone should stay with you and thrive with you you're an evp territory if you're in the here's what we're actually going to send to all of our employees the swag perhaps to kind of make them feel motivated and loyal right now you're in the territory of employer branding you're now doing mm -hmm. the, the thing that is going to make them feel the way you want to make them feel interesting and I, I want to kind of add on I think most people when they hear the word emotion they go to very very base simple emotions I want to feel happy or I want to feel yeah. angry like they're very raw emotions and 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 really there's so many different reasons why you like working there. You feel, and the word feel is important here, like I'm connected to a larger idea. I feel like I'm connected yeah. to a larger team. I feel like my work is valued. I feel like my work is seen outside the universe and people appreciate it. I feel like, like there's a whole list of things you can feel. And I think one of the challenges and one of the things that gets us into employer blanding land is we think the emotions are simple and emotions are incredibly subtle yeah. and they are created so many different ways but i think we have to say look if you're going to pinpoint to me i think of them as motivations as much as emotions but what is the yeah, reason yeah. you're driven to do a thing that's all feeling that is all emotion but it's not just raw um you're gonna feel happy every day like so many websites feels like that. it's all stock art of people smiling right it's all just the yeah, same yeah. over and over like i been at a lot of companies and maybe I'm just a sourpuss, but I've never seen as much smiling at work as I do in the stock art that com covers your website. So tell me what's going on there. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 I think particularly, um, we, we notice it obviously because um, the standard of dentistry in Britain is not quite what it is in the States and we sort of see your websites and there's a lot of white teeth going on and you go, well, they obviously don't employ anyone British there at all because we don't have dentistry that good. But um, yeah. I, Everyone knows there's a veneer, right? And, and we've got a sophisticated audience who know when they're being marketed to, and that's okay. They, they will tolerate a degree of marketing, but if it goes too far, okay, now they're not gonna believe you anymore. They, they don't mind you showing you on your best day in the same way that, you know, if I'm going out for the night, I might put on some smarter clothing and I might iron this shirt a bit more carefully. You know, that's yeah. fine. Everyone accepts that within a degree, but there comes mm -hmm. a point where you go, oh, no, no, now this person is lying to me. I, I want to add one more thing because I think it's interesting the way you're talking about the connection between employer brand and EVP and the way, and I know we're about to get into what does an EVP look like and what can it look yeah. like. My metaphor that I go into is that the employer brand is the sum total of all your activities and all the feelings around what it's like to work there. The EVP is the tent pole that props all that up. It's a big tent, and if without that EVP, it just kind of lies flat, doesn't take up much space. The tent pole of the EVP says, okay, now you understand all the room in which you have to work. That's kind of, yes. and it's a, it's a rough metaphor, obviously, but it's, it's, it's just a, a different way of showing the connection between the two. I think where there is going to be a significant difference, though, is exactly which EVP definition you're using. And I think that's where yeah. we should go next, because there are, okay. I would say there are two distinct camps on the definition of an EVP. And I know some smart people in both camps. It's fine. You just have to yeah. know which one you are doing. And you know, this is a conversation I have with clients a lot. And, and I'm going to put it this way. The big differential is, is an EVP what you are offering employees or is an EVP what you are offering employees and what you are expecting from them in return. And those are two very, very different things. And you, there are some smart people who use alternate things. I'm very much in the camp of no, it's what you're offering. The, yeah. Keep it simple, Same. keep it succinct. Yeah. What you're expecting in return is going to be defined somewhere else, possibly in a competency framework, possibly in your values, in a different yeah. thing. But if you try and do both at the same time, you can end up with something that doesn't really do either. Yeah, and that's dangerous. It up. Yeah, you're in the yeah. Swiss Army knife territory where none of the blades seem to do much good, yeah. but you've got 17 of them, so yay, good for you. I think it's really risky because, like, all employers enjoy far more explaining what they'd like everyone to be than they do like talking about what they're actually going to give those people in return. So I think yeah. it's quite helpful to keep them separate and, mm -hmm. and keep your EVP. This is what we offer. This is what someone gets out of working here. In the same way that the customer value proposition doesn't include the money you're expecting from them, right? It is yes. what they get out of this. It is a yes. one-sided version of the transaction. Um, and I, that's what I would use if a client says to me, which definition should we use? Because it's designed to draw people in, to give them a reason yeah. to learn more about you. And you don't do that by saying, this is what you're going to get. Like, you're, you know, this is what you're going to give me, right? It, 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 if it's serving the purpose of attracting and giving people a reason to engage, 
telling them what you want from them is not the way you do it. Yep. And, what's and the shape what's, of it? What's the architecture? Yes. Exactly. And, and this is where I'd say fairly assertively, there are no right answers. I have structured them completely differently for completely different clients. I always want to find the structure that works for you, not mm -hmm. the one that looks nice in my PowerPoint deck. Um, yep. and, and every single client I've worked with, the correct structure for them has been unique to them. And very often it's driven by something else that exists within your business. If you've got four values, I might decide I want to have four EVP pillars that fit alongside your four values. If everything in your company is in threes, your consumer brand is in threes, your, your slogan is in threes, you can bet your bottom dollar I want to have an EVP that has three things in it because it's going to fit within how your business talks. I think of e employer the EVP as you know a label of ideas, and I think of them in, in order of um, almost maturity. Right, you start, and let's say you're a hundred-person company. You're growing. Your things are going great. You want to kind of attract a certain person, and I say, of all the thousands of wonderful things you could say about your company, let's pick four or five that are really, really specific to you, that are attractive, yeah. that you can prove, that have a, a level of value, that are real. All those things, and just the fact that you're limiting and removing all the other potential options, you're creating what I think of as a brand direction. It's like, look. You don't yes. have to know exactly your compass heading, but generally north, south, you know, northwest is great. It's going to get you. And then when you hit 500 people or 1,000 people, let's reevaluate. But you don't need a, a full-fledged four-pillar EVP for 100 people. That's like making a Dewey Decimal System and you only own three books. It's like that's overkill yeah. uh, uh, you know, at, a, at a super light. So I think of – so smaller is employer brand, direct, or brand direction where you just focus. Yeah. Then you get to brand promise, which is a further distillation of that focus. That is yes. in the form of a promise. If you work here, you get, we promise you these ideas, these things, these, these opportunities. And you can, there are 4 million ways to take that. And then yeah. once you're a larger company and a more complicated company, and you've got more rigor around your thought processes, your communication style, right? Everything you all, you said about, is it a narrative? Is it three pillars? Is it four pillars? Does it match your values? Does it match your whatever? That is where EVPs happen because they are very architectural. Right? They're very structural. You can say, hey, how do I take this piece and apply it to that audience? Because you're usually at that stage such a big company that your generally employer brand isn't going to fit everyone equally. So you have modular functions to say, how do I speak to data scientists and biologists who are radically different audiences, but it's not feel like you're talking to them like they're, they, they're not working with the same company? Completely, completely. And I think, you know, some of this is going to come back to you need to think through who's going to use this thing. Once I've made it, who is actually going to pick this thing up and use it? And, and in particular, I talk to a lot of clients about who are the users who are communications professionals and therefore are used to like complicated brand structures. There is no point creating a complicated brand structure if the people who are going to use it all the time don't do that kind of role. Yeah. If it's like, so the internal comms team are fine with like a brand house that's a little bit, we'll come on to them in a minute, but you know, they're, they're used to a more complicated structure and that's fine. But quite a lot of people in TA don't come from that background. They've come from being, you know, they might've been in an agency, then they're coming to, their people are good at talking to people, right? So actually, you don't want to create a model that's optimized for writers. You want to create a model that's optimized for someone who likes talking to people on the phone because that's what you've hired this person for being. So yeah. create a thing that they can use if they're going to be the primary users of it. And, and you know that whole how complicated should we make it is dictated by well who's going to use it. Like if you're, your, your external agency should be able to use whatever you create if they're any good. Yeah. That's not a problem. But it's particularly the internal users of this thing. Who are they? And therefore, what's the most helpful thing you can give them is, you know, is worth thinking about. And, you know, make the language appropriate to them. You know, calling it pillars makes it sound quite formal. So you can have pillars, but just call them themes. And that will seem less alarming to people who are not brand and comms people. You know, it's what they are. It's fine call yeah. them that and you know that brand promise at the top of it or sometimes we call them a driving sentiment or something is yeah it's the one liner it's the elevator pitch is that if you were yeah. stuck in a lift with someone and said hey you should come and work with us because what's the end of that sentence right and it's it's not going to be four pillars and a powerpoint slide because you're stuck in a lift with them it's going to be a sentence and that thing is incredibly helpful for all sorts of people that's really helpful for like our creative teams when i hand a creative team 
you know, an, an EVP that consists of a number of pillars, I can see their eyes glazing over. But when they latch on to the brand promise, they go, oh, great, yeah, yeah, we'll do some ads based off that. They're very excited by that. That's the thing that they're going to get, they're going to latch onto and expand on. And, you know, it's bringing it down to that point of simplicity that is appropriate for who's going to actually use it. But yeah, yeah. decide what you want your EVP to be. Then have a think about how you might be able to structure it and what else it needs to sit alongside and then work out what the right structure is for you. I've been asked by so many clients before, how many pillars should our EVP have? And it's kind of like, well, I don't know until we've done the work. Yeah. We will discover that as we go. It's as many as we need and as few as possible.